Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Okay, workers, it's time to down tools and up coffee cups. I'm calling Smoko because it's time for some Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Gather round one and all, make yourself comfortable and get a load of what's in store for today. In our lineup this episode, we've got an encouraging story about adding lifespan to batteries and it's really simple, folks. We'll check on in on AI and see if we can make it, it make itself really useful, like diagnosing early symptoms of disease and such. And don't throw out your old f- iPhones and iPads. Apple has a plan and it's going to hook you right in. And speaking of hooked in, I've just been joined by the bloke with all the reasons that you join us week after week. Here's Matthew Dickerson, ready to hook us into today's episode. How are you, Matt? Hooking in. I yeah, like I the idea of the hook because it goes in and you can't just pull it back out easy. That's it's hooked exactly in right. and it's staying there. <laughs> and it is the highlight of my week sitting down and talking with you about just everything technology. I don't know where you're going to go in terms of some of I don't interest. know where I'm going to go sometimes. <laughs> <so> just <laughs> It's always enjoyable for me doing that. But just to have a good conversation. I often talk to people, maybe it's my age here, but I often talk to people about parties and functions and that type of thing and when you're a bit younger maybe you love the idea of just loud music doof, doofing away and you get on the dance floor <laughs> i'm just a little bit past you yell that. at each other from <laughs> that's right what, what was that but my favorite type of function event etc is sitting around a dinner table with a bunch of people having intelligent conversation about topics that are meaningful but i'm a bit lucky because every week i get to sit down and have meaningful conversations that are intelligent about things that are incredibly important. Exactly right. With you. I've so, got to say, I've learned so much in the last four or five years. It's been fantastic. And the problem I have is that I think we keep learning more, but we keep forgetting the other stuff that comes out the other end. Because mm. sometimes I do have people come up to me and say, now, I love that topic you talked about. And they start talking about it and I go, which episode was that again? Just remind yeah. me. I just need to go and listen to that little bit again to remind myself. Well, there have been some stories, some topics we've talked about that have developed over that time, mm. and it's been really good to um, to sort of follow how that's grown. And yeah. I look at stuff that would have passed me by if I didn't have this time with you. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Anyway, always exciting. Fantastic. All right, folks, let's charge into our stories for today. Now, if you're fortunate enough to live in a house with a yard, then you may be clever enough to be running a compost bin. Nice work. Good on you. But for so many of us, uh, well, for so many of those people living in high density living, I guess the scraps go in the bin, the bin gets stinky, and the stink gets bagged up, and the bag goes straight into the dumpster. Composting is such a better way. But Matt, is there any tech option for the concrete bound among us? Of course, there's a tech option for just about everything we do. Wonderful. And it is actually a problem, organic landfill, FOGO, food organics, garden organics, FOGO is often what it's called. Food or Fogo. I've never heard Fogo before, so talking really? about things that oh, we just learned. I've just Sorry. added something there else. So food organics, garden organics. It used to be food scraps, used to be the organic concept, but then the same concept you can use for food scraps, you can use for mm. garden stuff like grass clippings, for example. And we, we get uh, you know uh, composting sort of uh, education given to us since primary school. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the idea in a lot of households is get that Fogo – and then put it in your, often it's a green bin, kind of makes sense, and mm-hmm. you wait till it gets picked up maybe every week, and away it goes. But we're pretty good in Australia, we're pretty good in, in our state, that we have a lot of places that have that, but lots of places around the world don't. And when you look at data out of the US, for example, about 40% of the average household waste is FOGO, and about 25% of landfill is FOGO. Right. Now, the problem, of course, with that is that those organics are more likely to produce methane, which, as we know, we've yeah, talked about okay. it before, I've heard numbers anywhere from, say, 84 to 86 times worse than CO2 for trapping heat in our environment. So yeah, well. we don't want methane yeah. being produced out there, or you cows out there, stop it, please. <laughs> but essentially, if we can do something better than putting a landfill, that's obviously a good option. But not everywhere has a green bin. So what do you do? You just give up and say, well, I just put my Fogo in the normal bin. Or you can get a mill food recycler. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> now, what this device does, a couple of clever things I like about it. The first thing it does is it munches up and removes the moisture. So it's got some paddles inside. You drop your food in. 
overnight, quietly, and I haven't listened to it. So it's it. not like a garbage disposal? Like not just no. yeah, yeah. And there seemed to be a time with every American movie, there was some joke about garden disposal or put your finger down yeah. there or whatever. Well, they were very popular for a while there. I think they were, and they, they do sound noisy and they also sound scary. So yeah, you yeah. don't want to drop anything down there, including your finger in particular. But essentially, this is something that goes overnight. And what it does is it just uses some paddles to munch it around, but it's also heating it so that it gets rid of the moisture. Because you can imagine a lot of the volume of yeah. these food scraps is moisture. A lot of the volume of, yeah, anything that is um, sort of food-oriented is, is going to be water. That's right. So around about 80% of the volume of most of those is a, a moisture or liquid. Mm-hmm. So you heat it up, you get rid of that. You munch it up, you get to the stage where it's, basically in a smaller fibres. And what comes out of it, oh, sorry, just an added bonus there, it's also got a nice little filter, uh, an air filter. As it rotates around, it goes through a charcoal filter to try and reduce the odours. So it's ah. got air circulating around inside because one of the things I thought about, about anything that munches up food inside your house, it sounds like the stink. You, you leave it there for a while, that's right, and it's going to start to smell. But you've got this charcoal filter, it circulates air inside it, and then you go for a week, maybe two weeks, depending how much food you, you eat. And then eventually you say, let's empty this out. And you get something that, and I looked at the pictures of it, it looked like basically very coarse coffee grounds. Yeah, same right. sort of color, same sort of texture, but not the fineness of a, of a coffee ground. So you take that and then you can do whatever you like with that, sprinkle on your garden. If you've got some pot plants, do that. Or if you do have fogo bins, you can still put it in your fogo and basically it'll be already in that slightly more decomposed boat than a state. But also drier. Drier as well, that's right. So even with your fogo bin, that's going to get pretty smelly when you put your various food scraps in there. It probably attracts some other little pesky creatures as well. If you just had food scraps, whether it be in your house or in your bin, they might like to have a nibble on that. Once it gets to this state, they're less likely to want to nibble on this because it's not something they're familiar with. It's not the same sort of level. Yeah, So quite a good idea. This is something that I think we'll see more of. Even if you do have your green bin, I think you'll see advantage of this. But definitely in locations that don't have a green bin, people want to take steps of their own to make a difference. So, sorry, does it just look like a drum or a box that sits in the garage or something like that? It's small enough that it fit in the kitchen, so it looks like a a big bin in the kitchen. And it does seem quiet enough. It does its work overnight. So it takes four or five, maybe up to nine hours, depending how much is in there, to do its job overnight. But... When I listened to it just on a video, I haven't heard it in the, in the flesh, but it just sounded like a bit of a hum. I think mm. if you went to bed that was two rooms away, you probably wouldn't hear it at all. Or if you did, it would be just a very low-frequency hum. But you could choose when to turn it on. And is there a presumption that we could throw meat scraps in there, the fat and the gristle as well? No, I don't think so. Maybe not. I think, okay, I just, think it's really just about – Just the plant stuff. Yeah, the, the things you'd put in a fogo. So it really is yeah, the, gotcha. the bits of the strawberry you don't eat or maybe the skin of a – yeah. watermelon or whatever. So yeah. I don't know for sure, but I don't think they're going to be broken down in the same way. Yeah, yeah okay, fair different. enough. Yeah. So a bit rich is the only problem, $1,000 US to buy one of these. At so this stage, at this but stage. when they become popular, yeah. the technology becomes more common. It's the first one that's come out there. So there is a target for many countries to reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Mm. And that doesn't mean necessarily reduce food waste by scrapping it in something like this. Reduce food waste in general because we need more food to eat. Let's not waste it all. Yeah. But this obviously will be a part of that overall picture of reducing our emissions and certainly being kind to the environment. Now, anyone with a Google Home or an Alexa or any other variation on the theme, hell, anyone with a mobile phone even, needs to be well and truly comfortable by now with the idea that our technology is listening to us. But perhaps that's not all bad. Matt, Google's AI is listening in and it may just start diagnosing early symptoms of diseases. Is that right? Well, we've had this discussion, haven't we, whether our phones or anything are just listening in on us. They're definitely not, according to all of the companies that are asked about it. But... (laughs) <laughs> well, how do we go with our testing when we're talking about wedding dresses that time? Do we do we get a definitive result out of that? Sorry, uh, well, uh, you said it doesn't happen because it didn't work with you. That's I right. said it did happen with us. <laughs> so um, we didn't get a definitive answer. So we want you all to try talking about wedding dresses and just see what happens. That's right. Listen to this podcast. Put it out loud. Wedding dresses, wedding dresses. But wedding I do dresses. know that we've had, to say, um, uh, like, uh, I'd say a stereo, but, but some sort of a music player going or whatever. And or the television, and Google has responded to that. <laughs> Don't you love that? Yeah, 
It's listening. It's there would listening. be one way to drive people crazy if you were playing something, if you had a TV show, and one of the hosts on that just kept saying things like, hey, Siri, hey, Google, <laughs> <laughs> knowing that various devices in that person's household would start lighting up. For example, if you're listening to this on a loudspeaker right now, you exactly would just... Right. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Google. <laughs> <laughs> so Google's developed the health acoustics representation model. Now, I do like a good acronym or initialism. And this one, the health acoustics representation, the acronym for that is HEAR. H little e a r. So I like the fact that they've gone enough trouble to come up with a good acronym there. So well done to Google. But what they've done in this one is they've trained here on 300 million audio snippets of about two seconds each, featuring coughs, sneezes, and breathing sounds. Now you think, why? Why would you want to do that? Are you looking for a husky voice? Are you looking for a nice radio voice out there? What are you looking for? We've talked about it. Before, In fact, I think as recently as last week, we've talked about the fact that one advantage AI has is it can remember a bunch of stuff. It can remember all those noises. It can remember 300 million of those. So the first thing is it's got a good memory. We haven't. The second thing is it can remember what each of those different noises was associated with. So that cough, I know that cough has got certain signature in it that tells me something different to that cough over there. Mm. And it's got all those classified ready to go. So... After being trained on 300 million audio snippets involving, and I didn't know there were this many, 100 million different cough sounds. Gee, I'm struggling Did to you think say that 100 many cough. million different cough sounds? So apparently, when you start to break down the frequencies of those coughs, they're Goodness saying 100 me. million. So even for a human to listen to 300 million audio snippets of two seconds each, there's not enough time in our lifetime to do that, mm. whereas AI can be trained on that. Now, why do you do all this? Well, when you get all of that information, all of that data, then you have someone walk in and say, I've got something wrong, Doc, please cough for me. You cough, the AI model here says, oh, this person has tuberculosis, for example. Now, you might think TB is not a common disease anymore. 1.3 million people lost their lives to TB in 2022. Yeah. So it's still out there, even though we don't see well, it was, much of it. It was a big disease, a big issue back in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And people used to have to get their chest scan at school, yeah. I seem to remember my yeah. father saying. Yeah. So we've got some diseases now that we think we've mostly eradicated. Polio is one that we think we've mostly eradicated. Mm. So we, I think in this country, probably many people would think TB wasn't an issue. But obviously, globally it is. But it's not just TB. By doing a cough you can actually work out from that what might be wrong. Is it a common cold? Is it TB? Is it something more serious? What do you mm. need to do about this cough? Well, we're very lucky in this country. We've got pretty good access to doctors. Everyone would like to have more access to GPs, but in general, pretty good access. We can see a doctor if we really have to. We've got emergency departments. But in many countries, there's not a doctor nearby. There's not a doctor within QE. And actually finding how you would access a doctor is difficult. So the whole idea here is that you'll get to the stage where you could either visit a clinic and cough, or you could even cough into your mobile phone and then have an yeah, app wow. analyze what this cough means. So with that initial analysis, we've said it many times, the doctor is the final solution, but if you can narrow down when you need to see the doctor, you might be able to maximize the efficiency of the doctor. So here I am in a country that doesn't have easy access to a doctor, I've got a cough, or let's say my child's got a cough. Oh, no, I'm worried about this. Is it terrible? Is it something that's just going to go away in a week? I don't know. Here, cough into a phone, assuming you've got a phone. We'll upload that, or we'll get that analysed by this app. And, okay, it's a common cold. You'll be right in a week's time. Just lay down and rest and drink plenty of fluids. Or, yeah, right. holy shit, TB, I don't have easy access to a doctor, but I've got to get you to a doctor to do something about this TB. Yeah, wow. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm thinking like you wake up in the morning and going, hey, Google, should I go to work today? <laughs> <laughs> and see it. And then put on what the best fake cough you can. <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes, uh, you're making that up, go to work? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> right. Or maybe get a good report that you can send to your boss. Say, look, Google said that, mm. unfortunately, this cough looks like it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I better stay home today. So I, I do like the fact that we're using AI in ways that helps and complements our health system. And in fact, not just our health system, health systems mm. around the world. So fascinating, but fascinating yeah. how we can use AI in that way. But an important point, the Google, um, Siri, they're not doctors, but they just um, might give you a bit of advice to go and touch base. Might give you a bit of direction there. That's right.
Now, what is technology for if it cannot take mundane tasks and speed them up or make them easier or what the heck, just take them off our hands once and for all? Today, the question is, how much do you love cleaning windows? Now, there's a job that annoys the hell out of me. It's a job where you stand back, admire your handiwork, and then walk past just half an hour later, and you spot a streak that catches the light at just the right angle, and it's all you can see from that point on. Matt, bring me some good news about clean windows now. Well, I don't think it's going to be much help to you cleaning your windows unless you happen to live in a skyscraper. Right, okay. So this particular... We're about moving. <laughs> that's good, good. This particular robotic cleaner called Osmo is designed for skyscrapers. Now, there's a bit of an issue, apparently. It starts with a skyscraper, then it goes domestic. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay? It, well, you've got a one-story skyscraper. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> a ground floor skyscraper. Now, I must admit I'm not loving heights. I'll do things mm. that involve heights. You and me. But I just don't love the idea of heights. If I was going to be a window cleaner on a skyscraper... have to be a one-story skyscraper. <laughs> That's right, your, your house, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I just Maybe people love the outdoors or do it. Maybe people love heights. Maybe people just couldn't get another job. I'm not sure what people are attracted to being a window cleaner on a skyscraper. And I imagine the standard platform that you see and mm. in the movies there's always something where the platform slides down one side and someone's hanging on desperately until Superman saves them. Look at those old black and white footage. Uh, foot, it used to it just sorry, it used to be, I'm so excited about this, people just sitting on a rope um, like swing. They're just sitting on a rope swing and they're hanging 60 stories up. Well, I was talking to someone about this story earlier on the week and they said that they were in a skyscraper in Sydney and they looked at it and there was someone who was essentially abseiling yeah. down the building. I don't know if they had a, a seat easier. like you were talking about. Have they had clean socks? <laughs> well, they had. What they found funny was their implements were all tied on. So you're not cleaning yeah. and slip out of your hand and go, <laughs> look out, blue! <laughs> now we've got to go back up to the top and get it. So that's, yeah. that's right. Get so another one. they're all tied on. They've got all their things. So imagine that. Imagine your job each day. And again, if you love heights, that sounds like an exciting job. But imagine abseiling on the outside mm, of a skyscraper. No, I can't because I'm already starting to get vertigo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I need to get a bit sweaty at the thought of it. So this is an issue where they're finding, in the US in particular, a lack of window cleaners. Maybe they need to pitch it somewhat differently yeah. as a job. Pay but more. 70% of US window cleaners are over 40 years of, old, of age. And I don't know if there's a high death rate. Hopefully there's not. But essentially they're finding that in the next 10 to maybe 20 years' time, Many of these window cleaners will be retired and there's not enough new, younger window cleaners coming through, mm. taking up the job. So they need to have some solution technology to the rescue, of course. So Osmo is basically the world's first commercial window cleaning robot. Now, not only is it able to be cleaning windows to clean windows if a human can't or won't, but it does it three times faster than a human which kind of makes sense. You can imagine it's probably going through a process a bit quicker in able to move around. At the moment, they've deployed it in a 45-storey or on a 45-storey skyscraper in New York. It uses LiDAR, uses computer vision, uses force sensors for precise cleaning, so it knows how hard to push on there So there as it go. cleans. So sounds like, to me, a pretty cool idea. And you just want to know that there was some way that it was attached with some sort of safety rope from above as well in case it suction cups lost grip or something happened to it <laughs> and then forget about dropping a bucket of water down below it's this whole osmo coming Look down out below yeah you might get donged on the head by a osmo yeah so it, it sounds pretty good it'll save it stable itself in strong winds it's got ultrasonic sensors because it needs those to better handle taller buildings i think what we'll see in a few years time is we'll look up and there'll be many of these on different buildings. Mm. Maybe you'll be able to get to the stage where it'll come down to the ground, finish cleaning one building and walks across the ground and goes up the next building. They might be contracted out to various buildings. They might be owned by the buildings. I'm not sure. It, <laughs> it's a bit like the Harbour Bridge where you start cleaning the windows, the top on one side, you do that side, other side, other side, and then you come back around and have to start uh, yep, again. You start right again. Don't so, waste any time. It's a perpetual job. That's right. So I, I don't know if one machine is just – there's that machine for that building and away it goes forevermore or whether they're so quick at it they can go and do some other buildings in the meantime. But I, I think this will be definitely a tech solution for this problem. Now, lithium-ion batteries, they've taken a fair bit of negative press from conservatives in recent years. There's a lot of scepticism, particularly when it comes to battery longevity. 
as if the technology has reached its ceiling or something. Well, in something of a startling new development, it appears that even with the current technology available now, with a simple treatment as it rolls off the assembly line, a substantial amount of life can be added to the battery unit, Matt. Whenever you get your new device, your new toy, whatever it might be that's got batteries, there's always an instruction that says, charge fully before first use. Mm. And I've never been able to find if there's any good technical reason, any chemistry reason, any battery longevity reason as to why you do that. Nothing? No, No, I can't help you. I've never been able to find anything. And I wonder whether it's just the person will think this device is better if they can play with it for longer if it's fully charged rather than play with it half charged. Oh, that didn't go very long. I'm really frustrated with this new device I just got, whether it's a marketing thing or what. But anyway, that's still the advice, charge fully before first use. Now, this is a bit different. What I do love is that we do have lots of people out there researching things and trying different things. In the past, we've talked about batteries and slow charges seem to be better for batteries rather than fast charge. So you'd imagine the very first charge you put in it, or you want to just do a nice slow charge, go along at a moderate pace and everything's okay. But they've been doing some research at the SLAC Stanford Battery Centre. And I don't know why they tried this, but what the heck, why don't you try different things? They found that they did a high current charge in the very first charge. So they manufacture the battery, off it comes. We've always done a slow charge because, well, I guess what the last guy said to do was do a slow <laughs> charge. And it's the last guy before him. That's right, yeah. that's right. So they said, let's try a high current fast charge for the very first charge. And what the heck, let's see what happens. And what they found was the battery lifespan was extended by about 50%. So we're not talking a small That's change enormous. here. That's enormous. That is. So when you thought you might have been able to get 500 recharge cycles out of your battery before it got to the stage where it had lost too much battery life, that might be a 750 recharge cycle. So that's quite significant. Now, this is fine in the testing they're doing for things like mobile phones or toys or whatever, but so much work's being done in development now because of cars. So Mm. we're finding that there's some testing done at smaller devices, and it doesn't matter that much. If you can get a day and a half with your battery or two, or if you can get two years out of your battery or three, it's probably not the biggest deal in the world. Mm. It might cost you a small amount of money to replace that battery, but in a car, it's significant. So when you start talking about 50% extended life for your car battery, that becomes significant. There's some key collaborators on this, including the Toyota Research Institute, the University of Washington. So there's some big players playing into this to see how you can do things better. So what they found also in more experimentation is getting the temperature right while they actually do it and playing around with different currents to maximise that. So this is very early days in this research because it's something they've never said to do before. It's always been Mm. nice slow charging is always better. In fact, even as Tesla owners, we're told not to use superchargers too often because that's not great for the battery. Use it when you're travelling, sure, but Mm. normally just use your charger at home because that's going to be better for the battery. Well, hold on. Is that all wrong now? Should we be doing (laughs) high current fast charging on every time we charge? I'd still say no at this stage, but mm, before I do the story. Yeah, well, it's just that's that's progress, isn't it? It is. We we learn new stuff uh, when people try different things. And so keep trying, keep trying. Just keep trying. There are a number of drawbacks in the heart transplant game. There's the need to find a compatible donor. One size does not fit all. Then there's the need to live on immunosuppressants to avoid rejection. And of course, the saddest thing of all is that one recipient's relief comes at the greatest cost to another family. The anxious wait for a donor is sadly too long too often. So the need for a reliable artificial mechanical heart is enormous. Matt, there's hope on the horizon here. Hope on the horizon. It is one of those things, isn't it, that it's incredible that we can do a heart transplant. And we've had some mm. great pioneers in Australia with medis- medical it was breakthroughs. 1984, Fiona Coote was the first Australian to get a heart yeah, transplant. Yeah, so it's quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah. But as you said, it's wonderful. I've got this new heart that I need, but you know that someone's died probably in a motor car accident mm. where they're in the prime of their life and now this heart's in great working condition. Now there is some comfort for people that lose someone in that situation because mm. they think other body parts are helping other people. But still it means that you, to keep living, someone else has had to die. If we solve the problem with car accident, for example, then these people would die in other ways. So yeah. you've yeah. kind of got this lack of transplant. So it's not a great long-term model if we want to reduce things like the road toll. 
But maybe with mechanical components, maybe that is a part of the solution. Now, we know we've got mechanical valves. People get the choice, I think, when they get a valve replaced in their heart. Would you like the pig valve or the mechanical valve? And there's all this decision-making going through that process. But this is a bit different. This is the world's first fully mechanical heart, and it's the, or the first one that's been implanted into a human patient. Mm. So that's pretty exciting. Now, I'm a bit disappointed. I talked a moment ago about the acronym I'm a bit disappointed they couldn't come up with something a bit better. It's called the Total Artificial Heart, or TAR. Surely there's enough yeah. letters in heart that you could have come up with a better acronym. I haven't thought of one yet, but that you could have come up with something better than TAR. So that's a bit disappointing. I hope the rest of their research is going better. They put all their thinking into the actual building of the, the heart, perhaps. Maybe they need to get someone from marketing to go and come up with a better acronym. So it's made of titanium. It's about the same size as a human fist, so about the same size as a normal heart, which kind of makes sense. It's got to fit in that same cavity. It can pump blood at 12 litres per minute, so that seems to be enough circulation. You can still do some physical exertion, some physical activities. But what's pretty cool about it is it's got a magnetically levitated rotor instead of a normal, flexible polymer diaphragm. So a diaphragm, a bit like our, our heart, you know, kind of squeezes in to squeeze blood through. Mm. Uh, it's normally a normal sort of heart, a fake heart or a mechanical heart, with some sort of diaphragm. But this has got a little rotor, and this whole idea of using maglev means that you can minimise the wear and tear because it's not sitting yeah, on something and rotating or not. Yeah, that's right. But so, I'm thinking, so this problem, this sounds like it's not going to have a beat. It'll just whir that blood through. You won't have a pulse. Well, I was thinking that as well because you think, okay, you've got a pulse as a, a normal human because we know what the heart does. It's a, it's a squeeze action or, or a two squeeze action, yeah. if you like. But just having blood continue circling, there's no reason. You can't do that. You just need to get the blood moving around, picking up the oxygen, picking up nutrients exactly. as it goes. So it makes sense. And I'm thinking that the opening and closing of the valves makes that lub dub sound. So you're not going to hear anything. It's mm. just going to be. Zzzz. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds crazy. So let's do, you could play some good tricks on someone if they didn't know you had a mechanical heart. You go to the doctor. Just take my pulse for your doc, <laughs> and the doctor sitting there going, uh, "No, I can't. Uh, I can't hear any pulse. Are you actually alive? What's going on here?" Well, you can just sort of play dead in places and. <laughs> <laughs> on park benches and stuff, and well, I've seen in James Bond movies where James Bond has trained his body to reduce that's his heart where rate. It's most appropriate. Thank that's you very right. much. So Yours is a much better example. They think that you're dead, and they leave you be because in the movies, the good guys never get completely yeah. shot up and thrown in the river with lead weights tied around them. They've always got the ability to escape. <laughs> so that is quite fascinating about it. So at the moment, there is one person out there in the world that's got this heart inside them. Now, but it's still only a temporary thing, isn't it? Is that right? Well, or is he is he waiting? for a, a, a real heart transplant? Or do you know? Uh, or? That's a good question. I think this is the, the solution here is going to be use these on an ongoing basis yeah, rather okay. than yeah, right. going out wow. and saying put it in for the time being. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong with that one. But this particular early feasibility study was approved by the FDA, which you'd hope they do before they go and do it. So the FDA obviously thinks there's enough confidence to say at least you can trial it. And I imagine that the person you trial this on would be someone who is getting close to not being with us anymore because of their heart problems and there's no donor on the horizon. Therefore, you've got two choices. You can just die pretty soon or we can try this. And you mm. might still die or you might be part of this whole medical breakthrough and you might live for a long time. So wow. I think that's probably where you'd situate with this. What I haven't been able to find is how long it goes with what power source. I'm assuming they're not Iron Man. They don't have a little thing they plug into their chest and that just powers everything on them. So where is it getting its power source? It's obviously got to have some power to keep this going. If it's going to keep this little magnetically levitated rotor spinning, it's got to have some sort of power for that. And I don't know where that comes from, what you've got to carry on your Solar body. Solar cells on the top of your head. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Perpetual motion. You just start there. spinning and it goes forever. <laughs> so maybe you've got to have something you clip onto your body somewhere, you carry with you, you put on a belt, whatever, you think there's got to be something there. And also, that means you've got to be able to recharge. You've got to be able to keep mm. it going some way. So mm. maybe the previous story was better life out of lithium ion battery might be very relevant. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because even the fact that you can exert yourself physically, well, I get to the stage where my maximum heart rate now is obviously lower than it was when I was younger. That obviously is a limit on how fast I can rob a bike or how fast I can run. But with this thing, you just Crank it up to 11? Do you say I want to run yeah. faster? I just keep going. <laughs> just hit the button on your belt. Yeah, and away yeah, you go. Wow. So imagine 
Olympians that say, well, I want to compete in the Olympics, just give me a bigger one of those because surely that's going right. to be better, more blood <laughs> circulation. I don't know where oh, it stops. At this stage, me. it's really just keeping people alive. Where we go next with bionics. it. Bionics. It, yeah, yeah it's, it's, well, it is. It's the bionic man, isn't it? Early last year, headlines were made when a high-altitude balloon from China drifted across Alaskan skies, then across Canada, until it was shot down by the US Air Force near South Carolina. Now, spy balloon or weather balloon, we may never get the real truth from the Chinese government, but it surely gave the folks at the Pentagon a few ideas. Matt, I'm going to go right ahead now and predict a mysterious spate of UFO sightings all around the world for the next 20 years. The Pentagon's onto something. Well, I like the fact that you said the Chinese balloon drifted across different areas there. (laughs) Well, that's what balloons do. It's hard to control balloons. True, and that's what the Chinese authorities would like to have you believe, that it was just drifting across into Canada. And Whoops, I don't know where it happened. The U.S. military is focused on deploying some high-altitude surveillance balloons. They're saying they're surveillance. They're not saying they're weather balloons. But it's a pretty good spot they've got to view things from. There's a couple of other ways you can view things around the Earth. You can use geostationary satellites. They're about mm. 36,000 kilometres above the Earth. You've got to have a pretty good lens to get really accurate pictures, unless in the movies you just say enhance image and then you get <laughs> you a press perfect the enhance image. image button. That's right. Yeah, well, Why uh... don't we all have that? <laughs> so with... That sort of height, you're only getting your photography or your video to a certain level of accuracy because it's a a long way away. Yeah, You go for low Earth orbit satellites, you're talking about 400 to 600 kilometres above the Earth. Well, that's better than 36,000, but still you can focus on something and get a certain level of accuracy there. But also those pesky satellites at low Earth orbit go across our horizon on a regular basis pretty quickly. So from that perspective, you've got to then continually refocus that. That's a bit complicated. So then you can set up a drone, but a drone needs power to keep it going, and they're a bit noisy, and how high do you go with drones? They might be a bit easier to see and knock out of the sky. Mm. So balloons at about 18 kilometres is not a bad solution. You think about normal international passenger flights, they're at around about, say, 10 kilometres above the Earth. So 18 kilometres is high enough that you're not getting in the road of some A380s flying around from (laughs) from Sydney to LA or whatever it might be. So that's high enough, but also low enough, 18 kilometres, you can get some pretty accurate imagery. But those pesky balloons do drift, as you so accurately put it. But what they're doing with these latest ones from the US military is they're using AI to predict and then ride wind currents. So they can look at what's happening right. with the wind and so they can do better than drift. They can actually get maybe a Steerable little bit more accuracy. Balloons. Yeah, just by predicting where those wind currents are and then changing their altitude because they've got some control over altitude. Yeah. Changing their altitude to get to the wind currents the direction they want it to go. Isn't that amazing? So <laughs> it sounds pretty interesting. I mean, I'm not sure... That I love the idea they're getting better at surveillance balloons. I'm not sure they're going to surveil us too much, but who knows? We talk about some stuff on but this I'm program. Getting a lot cheaper as well. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? It, it does make sense to get them up there. And then they're obviously transmitting information back. They'd obviously have some sort of battery life limit, putting a lot of space on a balloon for solar panels to keep it charged up, to keep mm. transmitting that. So you'd bring it back down at some point in time. But the other thing that's quite interesting is that air to air missiles are quite challenging to use against balloons because there's no heat signature. So if you send a a plane, a a jet up there to shoot that damn balloon down, well, normally when you use your air-to-air missiles, you're relying on that jet in front of you with that big heat signature to be attracted. There's not much heat signature from a balloon. There's a little bit of electronics on there, but that's producing (laughs) next to nothing in terms of heat. So they're a bit tricky. You've got to get accurate and actually aim maybe an old-fashioned way and try and shoot that balloon down. So they're going to be uh, arming fighter planes with... Pins now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just fly into that balloon with the front of your plane that's nice and pointy, and away you go. It is quite fascinating, though, and just fascinating how we'd, we're using something so old. Balloons have been around for mm. a long time, and then finding out better ways we around can use it. Around the world in 80 days. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cameras have been deployed along roadways throughout the Western world in a bid to catch people in the act being unsafe, whether speeding or driving without seatbelts or being on our phones even. The pictures usually are quite revealing and make it very hard to argue against, but but not always. 
Matt, in some places, AI has been enlisted to enhance the whole shebang, and the certainty of being nabbed for being naughty has increased markedly. Well, the main reason I want to talk about this story is I love good Australian stories. So this is an Australian firm that's actually been deployed in the UK. So they couldn't find anyone in the UK good enough to do this. They had to come to Australia, which I love. (laughs) I love that. And they've been using this on some roads around Devon and Cornwall. And over a fairly short period of time, we're talking 25th of July to 17th of August, so not even a month, Mm -hmm. 2,239 seatbelt offences. But the thing that got me was 109 children unrestrained, including... Toddlers sitting on your lap. See, this strikes me as absolutely remarkable because if I get in a car and I'm not wearing a seatbelt, it feels weird. It but feels quite naked. clearly not for everyone. Not for everyone. But I'm the same as you. I've jumped in a taxi and the seatbelt, I'm mucking around the seatbelt. I say, hold on, I've just got to get this seatbelt on, driver. Oh, that one doesn't work. Move it to the other side. And, and while I'm sitting there, I just go, it's, it's not right. There's something not yeah. right. Move it to the other side and get it clipped in right. I can, but I'm then to have now. a child sitting on your lap, it'd be like... No, there's nothing right about this. <laughs> there's nothing right about this. Now, I remember back, you know, in our car, our family car back in the early 80s, it had seats that didn't even have seatbelts. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, those those days are long gone. Long gone. And people who and think... it just feels ridiculous to be in any situation where everyone's not restrained. Correct. And to, to think that I'll just put my arms around the baby and I'll be able to hold onto the baby if we have an accident... The baby will be safe. Yeah. I don't think people realise the forces involved in an accident or maybe the weakness of their mm. limbs in terms of trying to hold onto that baby. That baby would go yeah. through their arms in no time at all at, I would think, a fairly low-speed collision. And then you've got a baby's head bouncing off a windscreen. But the technology that's detecting this is just getting so good now. So they're taking photos as basically every car goes past. And then AI is looking at that and they're identifying Here's a baby unrestrained. Here's someone without a seatbelt. It's just fascinating how good it is, how accurate it is. And as you say, mm. you get the fine and the mail, and here comes the photo, and you go, hmm, mm. can't really <laughs> argue with that one. I can't say, officer, I'm sorry, I wasn't going that speed. It's like, there's a photo, no. and there's me on the phone. Or I'm no sure I had on. my seatbelt on. That's no, right. you clearly didn't, and clearly neither didn't. did your five kids. I actually did a bit of promotion, helped a uh, foundation recently with a bit of a promotion around some safer driving, and the whole promotion was, don't be that driver. So you see someone overtaken double yellow lines. Oh, look mm. at that driver. See someone in their mobile phone. Look at that driver. So the whole promotion was don't be that driver, which mm. I quite like the cleverness of that. But one of the things that they talked about when we were going through this process and, and launching this program was the, the guy launching it said, I just don't get it when you get in a car having had too much to drink or get in a car and not put yourself on. It's a deliberate decision to do something stupid. He said, yeah. I'm not condoning it, but he said every now and again, I understand why someone might speed. They overtake someone and the, the person was doing 10 k's below the speed limit and they just want to get past them quickly and they might just inadvertently for a short period of time accidentally go over the speed limit and then adjust it back down. You can accidentally go over the speed limit, but I just don't see you can accidentally drive off without having a seatbelt on. Accidentally yeah. drive while you're drunk, for example. I didn't realise I had 10 beers at the tub. Who knew? And I got in the car and I thought I was okay. I mean, so those deliberate decisions are having a bit of an impact. There's a bit uh, been done on you know, criminal psychology and, and, and the certainty of being caught. Right. So it's not about the punishment that uh, is the deterrent. It's about the certainty of being caught. So if you, you can have a much weaker penalty but have a much better effect at stopping people from causing offences if they know that they're going to get caught. And so something that's as simple as this, having these cameras about, people say, oh, it's just a revenue-raising device. Yep. Well, if you know you're going to get caught along a stretch of road because there's a camera on it, because you know it's going to get a great photo of you and there's no opting out of it, well, then you're going to take steps to to avoid that, that, that fine. That's fascinating. So the next time I get a fine, not that I get very many fines, but just say the next time, I might just send a letter back to the Office of State Revenue. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> well, no, no. And I can say, okay, look, I understand the fine, but I'm not going to pay it because that's not the deterrent. The deterrent is now that I know you can catch me. <laughs> so don't worry about the money. It's okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, if, if people know that they're going to get caught, they're much less likely to offend. And this, this is interesting because one of the bits of data which I found fascinating was that using this similar technology here in Australia, which it's been used here in Australia before it's gone off to the UK, When they first introduced this, AI was picking up one in 80 people with mobile phone offences. So that's fairly scary, isn't it? Of Mm. every 80 cars that went past, one of those 80 was on their mobile phone. That's significant. Mm. 
Now, the latest data they've got, over obviously being used for several years, one in 600. So it's still too high, but that's been reduced. Now, yeah. maybe it is exactly as you say, that people, I heard Jimmy got caught, I heard Mary got caught, they hear about someone being caught, oh, I don't want to get caught. Yeah. They don't even ask what the fine is. Maybe, or maybe they do. Maybe that's part of the deterrent, but just the fact that they got caught. So great to see our technology going out across the world, and it is absolutely fascinating technology. Mm. It appears that Scarlett Johansson's claim that OpenAI was using her voice without licence and the legal stoush that ensued hasn't been enough to deter other AI engines. Matt, it seems that there are some new allegations from people with professional voices, and now it's on for young and old. Is nobody's voice their own anymore? Well, I'm waiting till our voices get copied, James, and then we well, can sue someone. you've already done it once. Yeah, we've done it for us. And <laughs> I haven't made any, well, whoops, I better not talk about that one. So this one here was quite interesting. There was a couple and they were driving along, minding their own business, and just listening to the radio. And next thing you know, it was actually a podcast I listened to, but next thing you know, on the podcast, along comes a couple of voices, or one voice to start with, they heard, and they went, hold on, darling, that sounds like your voice. And they kept listening, and then they heard another voice, which sounded very much like the partner's voice. So wow. suddenly, they've got their voices being heard, and they went, I'm just not sure that we ever gave permission for our voices to be used. What's going on here? As they investigated it further, they they were voice actors. So they were out there regularly using their voice for different things and they'd been asked to do some radio scripts and read a whole range of things for radio. They were paid to do that as part of that radio script. That's fine. Unbeknownst to them, those radio scripts were then used for these various voice actors to basically be used to train up some AI voices. Now, you mentioned Scarlett's particular predicament there where they asked her and they wanted to pay her to use her well, voice. Well, that was the original one, wasn't it? That's I right, think, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they just used, she said, no, they used it anyway. Well, no, it wasn't her voice. It just sounded a lot like her yeah. voice, which sounds a bit too fine a, a, a take you, you're going there. But, but this particular one here was basically, there wasn't even a question. There was no question at any point in time saying, can we use your voice? Can we actually take your voice and use it as part of it was a podcast? A, we like that voice. We're going to use it. We're going to use it. So this is a major problem. This is a problem if your voice is the way you make money. So if you are a radio host, if you are a voice actor, if you do cartoon voices, whatever it might be, then your job is at risk. Now, is this something we should all jump up and down about and say, let's stop it? Or is it something we should say, well, let's use some people's voices in an appropriate way and pay them correct compensation? Or should we just say, well, sorry, it's a wild, wild west. Let's go for it. Yeah. I don't know the right answer, probably not yeah. the last one. But <laughs> it's an interesting process. And people listening out for their voices, they may start to hear their own voice coming back at them without them ever being involved in that process. Well, so in the US elections, Kamala Harris can be saying whatever Donald Trump wants her to say and vice versa. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's a can of worms and it's, it's enormously troubling. And we think we can identify someone pretty accurately. We're pretty clever humans. Yeah. We pick up the phone, g'day, how are you going? Oh, it's James on the phone. That's something we do without thinking about it. Mm. So voices are very distinctive. So we know certain voices. So when they get replicated, we would hear that ad on radio. We would think that would be a presidential candidate or whatever it might be. So, yeah, pretty yeah, scary. And I guarantee, you know, regardless of what your opinion is about now, uh, if you hear your voice saying something you didn't say, I'm sure that would be something to really wind you up. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, I this will be involving legal people for some period of time, I would imagine. Mm. Who's going to win this? I don't know. But we'll update as we know, as Mm. we find out more. But it is something that we just don't know where the legislation is going to sit with some of this. The issue of the enormous volume of global e-waste continues to snowball. We all know that recycling of devices can occur, but the reality falls well below the possibility. People are still needing the latest and greatest and simply ditching their current units well before their expiry dates. Well, in the spirit of everything old is new again, Apple is now making an effort to repurpose old devices and tweaking our old nostalgia nerves while they're at it. Matt, if I have an Achilles heel, it is my penchant for nostalgia. (laughs) Bring it on. What's Apple got for me? Well, the main reason I like 
old games is because they're the only things I can beat my kids on <laughs> for at least five minutes before they get the hang of it. Bring on Centipede. <laughs> centipede? You? Well, I don't rate Centipede, I'm sorry. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> what are we talking, Space Invaders? Donkey Kong? Yeah, Donkey Kong. Asteroids, what asteroids? Asteroids, asteroids. Okay. Asteroids seem so pointless, yep. absolutely pointless, that I actually might be able to keep beating my kids before they get too bored playing it and say this is useless, I can stay as a champion on Asteroids. Well, Galaga used to suck the 20-cent pieces out of my pocket. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. So you're talking some classics there. Now, in the past, if you wanted to emulate some of the apps that allow you to play some of these on an iPhone, you had to jailbreak your iPhone because App, uh, sorry, Apple, for some reason, didn't love the idea of emulator apps on uh, the App Store. Mm. For whatever reason. Don't know why. They have their reasons, obviously. They've changed their mind and they said, no, nah, it's all right. Maybe because they can make money out of it. Might be part <laughs> of it, the cynic in me would say. But now you can get emulator apps on the App Store. So you can now basically emulate old game consoles, Nintendo and Sega, for example, so you can run some of those classic games on a modern device. Wow. <laughs> now, the cool part about it is, of course, you can put that on your iPad, on your iPhone, but you can also then connect it through to your TV and play it on your TV. And some of these, I've actually played some old games on a modern TV. <laughs> they didn't look great back in the day, no. but the TV wasn't great either. No. Now you take a 4K TV. And, and you they know, just look terrible. They do. <laughs> it's yeah. so pixelated. I got an, an an Atari, a modern Atari for um, Father's Day one year, and my wife actually just in the last week said, you never play that Atari anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's something to do with that. It's just you think, oh, we used to think this was the, the bee's knees. I think we need an old CRT-type TV that's really <laughs> quite low-res itself to make the games look realistic because it just it looks a bit funny on a modern, that's right. high-tech, and large Hong. screen. Pong with its boop, Pong. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, that, um, yeah. And, and also the high <laughs> level of graphics in Pong itself. Yeah, That's obviously I not know. lending itself to but 4K TV. I used to hang out and just wait for a Saturday afternoon to come so I could go around to my mate's place and play Pong. <laughs> I didn't really think Pong was that good. <laughs> For a little while it was. Well, when it was probably the only thing that was like, isn't yes, this it was the only thing. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So our standards This below. is pre-Space Invaders, folks. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a good idea. Why not use all that power on an iPad or an iPhone, on a modern smartphone? Why not use that power and let it emulate these apps? And I'm sure the gameplay would still be faster than it was mm. because some of the times when I would lose out to some of those games, it was because they couldn't keep up with my controller couldn't keep up with how fast I was. Obviously, it was never yeah, my that's skill. Right. That's it. <laughs> so I think with the modern power you've got, they could run these games quite easily. They could handle basically the basic graphics we're talking about here. So I, I think it's a good idea. And I haven't done it yet, but I've got to go and download some and see what games I can get hold of. So the next time my kids can come home, I've already practiced up on mm. some of these games and make sure I can smash them. I wonder how many uh, fans of the Sega Master System can remember Alex Kidd in Miracle World. Uh, and I wonder if they've got that game because I was able to clock that game. And yeah, I tell you right. what, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm <laughs> I ready, don't remember. Ready for a second world. bite of the cherry. There. I don't remember that one. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, I've lost that one. Sorry. And that's all there is today, folks. You can hang around if you want to, but in about two minutes, it's just going to be the sound of me clipping my toenails and maybe then folding my laundry or something. So. Uh, all the same, thanks for another spectacular tech talk, man. Have you got a tech way of clipping your toenails? Have you got some sort of device? There There's no electronic it? toenail clipper yet, but yeah, right. if there is out there, I'm interested. Let's go and find one of those. So I'm not going to look for that. I'm just going to go and get the binoculars out and start looking to see if I can see some balloons 18 kilometres up. I'm not backing <laughs> myself in, but let's go and have a bit so of a look anyway. enough with the bird spotting. <laughs> That's right. It's now balloon go spotting. Go for the balloons, why not? Why not? Okay, and I'm off to avoid all the homework that I'm supposed to be doing and um, get into the, some productive procrastination, as we'll call it. I may even have to go to the sunroom windows and daydream about window-washing robots. Thanks for tuning in again, folks. Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson is made with a healthy smattering of all five, five food groups in just the right amounts. It's good for your heart, your liver, your kidneys, but most of all, it's great brain food, folks. Come and consume our podcast guilt-free. I'm your host, James Eddy. Signing off for another episode, it's a pleasure to bring you this tidy little podcast and we hope to catch you once again in a week's time. If you haven't already, click the like button with your provider or go all in and click love and then tell all your friends about us. It'll make you feel great, you'll see. See you next week.